Hello, everyone, and welcome to 180 Degrees of Impact. Today, I am very excited to be joined by Mary McVeigh. Hey, hey, Mary, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. I'm doing very well, and I'm excited uh, to be able to chat with you about Soccer Without Borders and about the work that you're doing. Um, we met at Boston Greenfest, and I really want to kind of dive into your mind to get a better understanding of what you do and how you do it and the philosophies that drive you because um, as I mentioned before this, this chat of 180 degrees of impact is all about um, you know you telling your story and talking about the work that you're doing so we will get into it but um, as part of that I'd love if you could introduce yourself uh, you know how do you how do you introduce yourself to people <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm Mary McVeigh. I'm speaking to you from Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, at the Soccer Without Borders he headquarters, where you can't tell that because I'm just in front of a, a boring wall. Um, I am a native New Englander and have grown up with uh, soccer as a core part of my identity. I'm excited to talk about how that's evolved into an organization um, that I'm co-founder and executive director of Soccer Without Borders. Awesome, and I have to say, I was I I do my research before these uh, before these calls, and I um, found an interview with you, it, one interview, and it was an interview with two little girls. <laughs> were asking all about your background, so I'm a little bit more familiar because <laughs> of their great journalistic skills. I really hope that they're going on to like host anchor Good Morning America. I hope so. They were pretty cute, so it's going to be hard for this interview to top that one. <laughs> I know, I was thinking about I'll that. Do best. <laughs> but I'll do my best to be a, a, the runner-up. So, <laughs> uh, like, what's what's your, um, what's the, the backstory? I'd love to know. I, I know that you started playing soccer when you were really young, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, could you tell me more about, uh, you know, you know, how that passion continued over time and then um, how that led you to Soccer Without Borders. Sure. Um, I think the first kind of key moment in the soccer background is when, when I was in second grade, my family moved to Hamburg, Germany. And I had, I had just started playing soccer in one of those leagues where you occasionally run the wrong direction and score on the wrong goal. Um, but this was Germany, 1988 to 1990. They won the Italy World Cup in 1990. So it was, you know, one of the biggest soccer crazed countries at one of their pinnacle moments in their history. And it, soccer was life there. Um, for, for a seven-year-old girl, it was really interesting that in Germany at that time, there were no girls teams for me. So I played with boys. I think that's where kind of the soccer competency came about or why I came back to the States a little bit ahead of some of my some of my peers from playing with boys for two years in Germany, um, but I think the bigger thing is I went to public school, I didn't speak any German, didn't know anybody, and soccer was my savior in that. It's how I made friends, it's how I learned the language, and it's how I felt at home um, during those two years. So I think that always stuck with me in terms of, you know, I was fortunate to have had great coaching, great opportunities and became a, a good soccer player enough to go on to play in college and professionally. But through that, it was never just about playing soccer well. For me, it was always that, that little seven-year-old that felt at home because of soccer. And it was about the community and about what else it can do um, to support kids in, in different situations. Um, I can't imagine having been that kid without supportive parents and you know my father who spoke German fluently and could navigate those systems so to imagine going through that kind of transition without those social supports you know is is a big part of um, how I have, have so much empathy and compassion for refugees and immigrants that we serve who are going through that transition and really trying to navigate it without a lot of those tools. So the Soccer Without Borders sort of emerged from um, that love of the sport. As I went on in my soccer career to, to coach and play, um, there was a, an increasing awareness of how fortunate I was as a, an American woman 
in the 90s and, and 2000s to have all these doors open um, and that that was not the case anywhere else. Um, so Soccer Without Borders was sort of the combination of, of that awareness of, of gender and how um, women, who, when they advance on the field, also advance in business and education. And then also that, that sort of core feeling that soccer can be a home. So I think if you kind of put those two things together, you have this uh, aha moment where, you know, soccer can change a trajectory for a kid. Soccer can be a home and soccer can shape cultures in the way that people think about gender, the way they think about um, community and it just kind of grew from there. Yeah. Wow. I had, I just had an aha moment as you were explaining that because like a lot of people, um, even in the U S where, uh, you know, it, it's a debate, you know, it's debatable how popular, I don't think soccer is as popular as it is in a lot of other countries. Right. I grew up around soccer and playing soccer. And, um, you know, as you were saying that, like the, the things we could learn about culture and about gender dynamics on the field, like it just clicked with me because for instance, I was in a co uh, co-ed league, uh, the mountaintop league in my hometown. And, you know, I, I don't know exactly what it's like now, but it was always mostly guys on the team. And then, you know, a few or mostly boys on the team for these, um, I think like three and four year olds all the way up to like eighth grade. Um, and then a few girls on the team. And I don't, I, I actually remember noticing at the time that a lot of the time they wouldn't necessarily feel engaged or wouldn't uh you know wouldn't feel as part of that because of those dynamics so i mean soccer is a game but there's a lot of you know there there's a lot to be said for life like you were saying in those dynamics I, i'd love to know like what were the what are some of the examples of the things that you saw um when it came to the challenges particularly that women were facing that you felt yeah. you need to address? So one of my first trips with Soccer Without Borders was, actually it was my, my first trip, um, was to Nicaragua, which is a, a country in Central America. It's the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere after Haiti. So, you know, I went in not expecting to see a lot of, of resources for men or for women, um, you know, boys and girls. And, and that was true. But, you know, soccer is, is low cost, so usually anywhere you go, even if even in situations of low resource, you'll find soccer being played, which is why it's so powerful globally and such an opportunity globally to shape communities. But in Nicaragua, it was rare, if at all, to see girls um, or women participating in any of the soccer that was going on. There was a whole organized boys league under 10, under 13, under 15, um, four divisions of men's adults and nothing on the women's side. They were just considering having a women's league nationally when I went in 2008. And so for me, coming off of my playing career in the U.S. and going there and, and talking with some of the women and then seeing that there was no pipeline, girls, disproportionately girls would have to go to school and come home and take care of younger siblings, do housework, and boys were by and large sort of out and about, um, you know, out of the house playing. And so that, that gender dynamic starts very early. You know, why does your daughter have to do laundry when your son is out, you know, running the streets and playing soccer with his friends? And so had a lot of conversations with women there um, and tried to get to like, what are the root causes of this? Are some of the girls interested in playing and never have had a chance? Will there be massive cultural pushback if we try to start that. Um, and so we, we, we did. We started it and started asking girls um, to play. We, we would recruit them out of schools. And we found that, you know, kids are kids. So if you're playing soccer and you give the girls a chance to play, and especially if you separate the boys away so they're not playing in front of the boys who are laughing at them, you know, they'll develop that same spark many of them will, um, for the game that, that any other kid would. And so, you know, it starts, it's where kind of opportunity meets intention and you can grow something from that. Um, but I think I, I, 
the one of the moments that made it very real for me about the kind of obstacles that girls face from within themselves, within their family, within their responsibilities, but also what are the, some of the top-down obstacles around the powers that be designing a girls' league opposite a boys' league, just creating those chances. Um, when I was there, I was there with a friend who also played in the WSA with me, and we found ourselves, we happened upon this pickup soccer game um, by Streetlight at night. I think I've told you this story before. And we were there with our friend Chepe, who was, who's male. And it was a 3v3 pickup game. So the three of us happened upon this game and said, you know, can we play in? And they just laughed at us. It's six men. Why would you want to play in on a team with two women? <laughs> you know, what's going to happen? And, and we did. You know, somebody won the game. We switched teams with them. We come in and we won you know, a lot of games in a row and they were shocked. They went from feeling like this is an embarrassment to then feeling angry and blaming each other to finally at the end, it was just like, Hey, this is a good game. You know, if you can play, you can play. And I think that that was another aha moment for me where there people are open to change if they're exposed to it. It's hard to imagine change if you've never met two women that can beat you at soccer, then how can you imagine in a city where no girls play, how can you imagine that to be true? Um, so I think there, there is this combination of working to provide opportunity, provide access, address some of the internal challenges that kids face, and then also work with the people who have the ability to make community level change, national level change, and give them the chance to do that, you know, expose them to what, what would it look like mm -hmm. if it was just equal. If any pickup game you happened upon, it would not be surprising to see 50%, 50% men and women playing and playing equally well. You, I, I love that story because <laughs> it's, it's um, like in a lot of ways, I think a, a lot of people are surprised that, uh, especially in the U.S. today, I'll say, or in, in my experience, a lot of people are surprised to encounter, like, it, and I think sexism less than a lot of other isms, to be honest, but because because it's so common, like, you see it all over the place. Right. Uh, I say that because, like, that sort of story just points out, like, you are a modern woman who, like, has experienced sexism, like, ton, and, you know, I... I think it's important people know that like um it manifests itself in all sorts of places even when you wouldn't expect it like somewhere where you would I mean where as you showed you know if you can play you could play and um you know it's just so interesting to me I I think the, bi the big question I have is how has that experience and how have those aha moments informed the work that you're doing today with Soccer Without Borders? Yeah. Um, you know, we, forming an organization, having an idea and forming an organization are two parallel things, but very different skill sets. Um, and so in terms of the work and the program and the passion of, okay, how do you take this uh, potential for change and turn it into a program model that actually creates that change. We have been in our first decade very focused on that individual, you know, on that girl. How do you equip her with the skills and supports she needs to, yes, access soccer, but actually translate those skills off the field into reaching her potential in education, in her employment? You know, how can you get her to access opportunities she she deserves and, and reach her potential? So the program model that we that evolved from that is holistic. So soccer is a, a piece of it, but then there are tangible educational supports that uh, we need to provide or we need to partner to provide in order for kids to advance academically. Mm -hmm. So almost anywhere in the world, an academic credential is valuable to, to a person in order to access employment opportunities um, and create a, a sustainable living. So that may be a high school diploma in some places, it may be higher education in others, but having access to 
uh, academic and educational opportunities. So for us, that means providing support in the form of tutoring. It means working with schools to identify behavioral challenges or how we can support kids to be motivated in school. You know, how, if you were as motivated in school as you are on the soccer field, you know, can we have it be a dual motivation, um, reduce absenteeism? Can we actually provide language support in the case of newcomers that, that may not speak the language of the school? Can we provide support so that they can learn English faster? Um, and then there's a, there's a, a community and a social piece. So team building and civic engagement and cultural exchange are the other three components. You have soccer, educational support, and then these, these social components that are, you know, your immediate peer group, mentor, the mentorship of a coach, the support of your team, um, civic engagement. So engaging with your community and seeing yourself as valuable and valued within your community and cultural exchange, the ability to, to, really be proud of, of your own background and own culture and also um, open to others. And I think soccer is uniquely suited to do all of those things. Uh, it's inherently social. And you, right on the field, you learn so much about interacting with people who have different skill sets, different experience levels, maybe a different style than you do. Um, and then also socially, soccer is a, is a cultural phenomenon like no other. Um, so. We designed this holistic model to really support individual young people to reach their full potential. Um, as we've grown, once you start doing that with thousands of young people across different contexts, then you start to create a movement. You, know, you, have, you have a lot of individual people that believe in it. You have their coaches and their supporters who've seen it in action. And now you have sort of a critical mass where you can influence at the level of a school or a community, or hopefully eventually a state, a country, a world. Um, so we're a part of different social change level um, efforts and movements, either within our own programs and advocating and bringing together um, people from different walks of life through our programs, but also by participating in networks um, at the national level and at the global level so that we can form a movement of people that are using sport for a greater good. Um, we call it sport for good or sport for development. And we believe that sport, and I have a bias towards soccer, <laughs> it has the ability to change the world. And we're gonna do our part uh, to contribute to that. I'm really inspired by how, you're, how you uh, took something and how you're taking something that you're so passionate about and also so knowledgeable about clearly um, with soccer and then translating that into something that really does a ton of good in the world like soccer in itself as you were saying is this cultural phenomenon but beyond that it's like what you're doing isn't just about soccer and I'm <laughs> I'm in awe of all that you're doing right now I, I'd love to know how did you actually like more from a process perspective get started because uh, I know a lot of people have passion but um, it's mm -hmm. hard to know where to start we were talking about spreadsheets before for yeah. instance so what were <laughs> know what to do when you first began um, so I think I think a lot of organizations start where you you actually don't know what you don't know. And you may and at every stage that you grow, there's a whole other set of stuff that you don't know what you don't know. Um, so being being a really excellent learner is probably the most important quality of trying to start an organization or build an organization. Um, I'm a I'm a co-founder. So we have we have a, a true founder, Ben Gucciardi, who you know, was the initial idea behind this and got the organization formed um, and really off the ground. And I met Ben about a year into Soccer Without Borders and we ended up building it as it is now together. Um, so I, I have a unique perspective where as a, as a co-founder, as sort of a second person to help it grow, I think I, I had the benefit of a little bit of distance from the initial, this is my this is my baby, I, I watched it get created to actually from the very start for me, it was about how can it grow? 
and how can we build the system so it can still be here in a decade and also be a livelihood? Can you grow it to the point that we could, you know, quit our other jobs and do this full time and bring other people in full time? I think that is a, a um, process for organizations to grow from that initial passion that's often fueled by, you know, young energy, which we had, we were in our mid twenties. Um, and then pair that with a business growth plan that makes it sustainable. Life will change from the moment that you start something. You may have hours and hours of time. You may have flexible vacation time. You may have, um, you know, maybe the first time you've asked your whole network to support you with funding. But after five years of asking people to help you support this passion, you know, eventually people want to see a plan and you have to grow the business. Um, and also there's many legal uh, regulations and things that, that require you to grow the business, require you to, um, as you grow, you need to track things more specifically. You need to report on things more specifically. And f when you're in human service, you should want to be tracking. Am I, am I sure that I'm creating impact and not doing harm? And are we achieving this mission? So we were very very much um, a pair of learners mm -hmm. and for uh, a period of time that's what we did we listened we learned we iterated uh, I learned accounting <laughs> I learned um, compliance laws across different states and countries so the the realm of learning is not limited to your program model we we did learn that and you know, what sort of elements are effective to, to achieve our goals in terms of impact, but also what sort of design of an organization is effective to be able to deliver services with, the, with high quality and consistency over time in different locations. And that's a, that's a business challenge that requires being a good learner in things that require Excel spreadsheets and, and aren't quite as fun. Um, as, as a lot of the reasons that people start with the organization. Yeah. Um, so I think for me, it was a, it was a challenge. I, I like to solve challenges. So if that challenge was how to get funding to add more educational elements, or if that challenge was how to switch our accounting system from cash to accrual, I approached it this, with the same energy and the same investment. Um, and the same desire to solve it. Mm -hmm. I was actually just going to ask about um, the challenge that, challenges that you feel that you faced, uh, but you already touched on a ton of those. Mm -hmm. Were there any others, any other key challenges, actually particularly looking at what the work that you're doing now at this, mm -hmm. what are the biggest challenges that you find that, that you and Soccer Without Borders face? Um, I think, Programmatically, you know, our organization serves populations that right now are, things are really uncertain. You know, refugees, immigrants, un unaccompanied minors, asylum seekers, marginalized girls, you know, incredible people that if society judged people differently would be, would be paid the most and the most successful people in society because they're incredibly resilient and incredibly talented in so many ways, but by circumstance have ended up in a, in a period of transition or you know, needing, needing supports to be able to reach their potential. And I think right now the uncertainty and the sort of climate around being a, uh, of, of different populations that are, that are underserved or are minorities it's a challenge. It, it's a challenge to advocate for yourself. It's a challenge to understand the political climate and what's true and what's posturing. Um, and kids are not always able to make those distinctions. Kids really take words at face value. And I think there is a real challenge right now in our schools and communities where kids are hearing rhetoric that adults may know is political posturing and the kids don't know that. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of bullying and there's a lot of um, very real challenges. Um, and I think direct, direct service providers, people who work with kids, 
be knowing what to say, knowing what is the right thing to do, knowing how to comfort that and, and also change that. There's, there's overwhelming desire to how do we change this? Um, so I, I think that's a challenge is the uncertainty of, of this sort of growing negative rhetoric and how do we combat that? Um, that's, that's on the program side. I think on the organizational side, our biggest challenge is we are a sector. The nonprofit sector is not designed for sustainability. You know, we are a gap filling sector. We are the organizations that meet gaps that the private sector and the public sector are unable to fill because it's not profitable or it's a, you know, a specialized subset of people that the government programs are missing. And so by design, you are not designed to, to sustain. And yet the problems are sustained. The gaps are sustained. And in fact, the gaps are growing. And so how do you design yourself for sustainability? How do you keep people energized, keep people working? Um, how do you compete in, uh, for talent in markets like Boston and the Bay Area where housing prices are going up? rents are up, how do you keep talented people doing social good work um, when it's, it's increasingly challenging to find funding for that? So I think that the organizational challenge is how do you, how do you build something sustainable and consistent when the nonprofit sector is not designed to be as such? I'm not, I'm definitely not an expert in, in terms of, um, nonprofits or in terms of doing social good and definitely not in terms of uh, sport for social good. Mm -hmm. But I think one thing that I'm, I'm really inspired with in, in your response and in speaking with you is like, I know that there are all these questions, like you mentioned, there's always, there's often when you're, when you have some sort of venture, the potential to unintentionally, unintentionally cause harm. Uh, and to um, unintentionally, you know, you might, you run into a lot of issues when you're, you mentioned different groups, um, like that feel more at risk or more vulnerable at this point. And I, I'm, I really admire that you're asking a lot of those questions uh, because mm -hmm. like, n I don't think anyone really has the answers or all the answers, especially as the questions continue to change. Uh, but it's, I'm, I admire that you're asking those questions and you see those challenges because that's the first step to solving them. And uh, I don't, again, I'm not an expert, but at least from my perspective, someone asked me, I would say like, I foresee great things coming, <laughs> coming from Sock with Outboarders and the work you're doing um, all because of like that mindset and that heart and the passion and the dedication, but really like that, that, ability to take a step back because I, I, I don't think I have a hunch that not every organization does that, unfortunately. And I'm not thinking of any specific organization, yeah. <laughs> but just saying. Um, yeah, we, we acknowledge from the start, we don't have all the answers. I, I, like I said before, I think our best quality has been listening and learning constantly and also listening and learning from, from a full range of people. So not listening only to experts and research, but listening to mothers and daughters and kids on the ground and mayors and school teachers and, and our kids, the kids in our programs. Uh, I think that one of the things we're most proud of is the number of alumni coaches that we have and the kids that have come through our programs that say, you know, I wanna, I wanna be a Soccer Without Borders coach and and then want to want to give back like that so it's a it's a powerful thing to see something you started start to evolve into a place where it's owned by the community that you aim to serve Con considering all of that who are some of the people that you support like feel free to name names or to shout out different great supporters of your work if you want to so some of the some of the partners that we've worked with um, yeah, I think that's the, the biggest, along with some advice for people to grow organizations, you can't do it yourself. So all the things that I mentioned that we sort of had to listen to and learn, in order to learn those, you need help. 
And we have been really fortunate to have some incredible partners. Um, Up to Us Sports comes to mind. They early on created this Coach Across America program um, and also an AmeriCorps VISTA program to give access to AmeriCorps staff members to small organizations like Soccer Without Borders was um, and, and still is. Um, And and I did the numbers, it's like over half of our staff, I think as upwards of 70% of our staff has been previously an AmeriCorps service member. So just having that pipeline, creating an entry level for work like this is incredible. And Opta Sports did that with Coach Across America. Um, Our two of our official partners, Senda Athletics and Roughneck Scarves, have been with us since 2007, 2008. We've kind of grown as they've grown we're both right around 10 years old um and it's and to have both the advice and advocacy of their founders us growing together and bouncing ideas off each other but then also the physical support of the scarves that we could sell to kind of earn our first revenue and roughneck scarves 10 years ago and, and we're still doing that today um and senda athletics is now our official game ball they provide these incredible fair trade balls um and they're setting the tone in in the soccer industry, the soccer merchandise industry, that 1% for the game, that's what they call it. You know, if everybody did that, if, if the Nikes and Adidas and Under Armors of the world did 1% for the game, like Send Athletics does, um, that would be huge. And um, I also, with that in mind, Street Football World is the network that we're involved in. It's a global network of organizations like us. Um, I think there's over 120 organizations now. And they are pushing this thing called Common Goal, which is 1% for the game. And they have Juan Mata and Matt Hummels already involved, where they've pledged 1% of their salaries to go back to and be distributed to organizations within the network, like Soccer Without Borders. And just imagine if that, that was other players, if that was every player, or if it was every soccer company, or if it was every club, it, we wouldn't be having a, a conversation about sustainability <laughs> um, if that were the case. If the game itself would invest in itself at every level, it would be it would be a game changer. And I think collectively we could change the world and have soccer be the leader in shaping the world for social good through the game itself and and through the way that programs like ours then can support young people, um, influence outcomes in education, in business, in communities, um, and address a lot of these social issues that aren't being addressed. Um, so, so those are some that come to mind. Uh, we, we have partnerships on every single level, so I hesitate to name some and not others. Um, one thing I'm really excited about right now is our partnership with Positive Tracks, which is for our ambassador program. It's getting young people under 23 involved in creating small fundraising events in their own communities to support our programs. So kind of a pay it forward model where, you know, this month Bethesda, Chevy Chase High School and Walt Whitman High School girls varsity soccer teams are dedicating their rivalry game to raising funds for a program of ours in the Baltimore area that's, you know, 20 miles away. So how amazing to think about kids who have grown up with this opportunity, channeling that opportunity and something they love into giving back to a a community nearby that needs that additional support. Um, So I'm really excited about that and we've worked with Positive Tracks to to kind of build the tools we need to support young people to do that. Um, They support us with a matching grant so that we can kind of give that extra motivation of your dollar becoming two. Um, so just some really exciting stuff going on across the board uh, in terms of, of partnerships at different levels, from the soccer balls we play with all the way to fundraising events, all the way to a global level, you know, trying to participate in this common goal shift. So there are many, many, many others, um, and, I, and I hesitate not to name them, um, but I, I think it's just, it's a collective effort. It's just like the game, it, you can't play without without every player contributing. Those on the field, those on the bench, those in the stands, and those at home that helped you get there. It's it's really like that. Before I get to the the last question, 
I'm going to ask. Um, I do want to know because you mentioned the other partners and, and all the partners you have. Um, where could people find out more about those partnerships and about the work that you're doing overall? Um, so on our website, and it, it's cyberlabborders.org, um, each of our individual programs has a partnership section that lists who their key partners are. Um, there's some logos and names and links out to those partnerships. We have a general partnerships page also on there that lists some of our national partners that I just named. Um, but I think, you know, a website is only as good as the staff you have to maintain the website. So, I, I, you know, we, we try to keep it as updated as possible. Um, but I think there, there is the people who are in it doing this work, they know that it's, it's not a logo on the website that makes you valuable. It's, it, it's the work that we're doing together um, that's impacting this community. That's what makes a partnership valuable. So we are, we are really fortunate to, to have so many great people you know, working with us to, to achieve these goals. Yeah, and I, I think before we wrap it up, mm -hmm. I have one last question. It's my favorite question. My favorite question. Um, if your life were a book or a documentary, <laughs> um, your entire life, what would it be and why? Um, so I have, two, I have two answers for this because I know you, it's your favorite question, so you gave me a heads up on it. I think our – I struggle with titles for everything. Our tagline, Playing for Change, stands out for me. I think that idea of, of truly just being passionate about the game but also using that game to make a change, um, you know, it's simple and – uh, that really stands out to me, but I, I think there there's many other elements that I hope would be in that. Um, one of them, uh, I wrote a Huffington Post piece a couple years ago that was called "The Helicopter in the Room," and that was maybe the best, most creative title I've ever put on something. Um, so maybe that could be a chapter in playing for change. But it's about how do we authentically collaborate across cultures, across power dynamics, and how do we make sure that resources are invested in the right places? And what do you, what do you do when, you know, what do you do with your privilege? And how do you, how do you convert that into um, positive change for, for communities and for individuals? So I don't, those are two very different titles. Um, I would hope that anything would include a lot of different chapters that um, feature all the amazing people that have helped us build Soccer Without Borders, if there was ever a book like that. There will be a book like that one day. Yeah. I, I'm sure there will be. You, you know, <laughs> keep doing what you're doing. And I mean, you have so many insights to share that I, I'm, first of all, I'm thankful for the fact that you, you took out this time to have this conversation. Um, but secondly, I'm, I'm also really thankful that you're doing the work that you're doing, even more importantly, um, to make the impact you're making. And I'm inspired because when I was growing up, and, and still in a ton of places, of course, um, you know, soccer, we look at soccer like, you know, it's the kids getting exercise and... Um, having a good time and building social skills and meeting new people. And, um, you know, I, I think what I see with what you're doing is there's all that, but then there's like what I'm thinking of this play with the purpose, which I think is this mm -hmm. new evolution that, that soccer with borders and all of the partners you mentioned are really pursuing. So again, I want to thank you for mm -hmm. taking the time out to chat. It means a lot. Thanks for giving me the opportunity, and I really appreciate the time you took, Matt, and all you're doing to, to amplify these stories, because I think that's how, that's how movements go forward. So thank you. I think you, you said something so important before, which at the beginning and again throughout, like it's all about learning, and we're learning from each other, and, I, and that's why I'm really thankful for the chance to do 180 Degrees of Impact and have these conversations. But... For anyone who's watching, uh, in order to learn more about 180 Degrees of Impact, um, the website is www.lets.care, it's L-E-T-S dot C-A-R-E, and then there's Twitter account at Let's You Care, Facebook.com slash Let's You Care, 
And so, Mary, you're amazing. Um, and for anyone who's watching, they're also amazing. And I want them to keep impacting. Um, but again, thanks, Mary. Much appreciated. Thanks. Have a great, have a great one. Thanks, everyone.